Okay. Hi, everyone who's watching at home and everyone in our room. Welcome back to our, our dev team crash course. We're going to talk about, um, today we're going to talk about Node, NPM. We're also going to talk about Intro to React. And that also requires a handful of prerequisite knowledge. So this is going to be a very chunky lesson, um, but hopefully it shouldn't be too tricky to follow. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen so all y'all can see what I'm doing. Okay. So right now I've just got the README open, um, but we're gonna go through the lesson plan. All right, so first up, we're gonna learn how to install Node, what those things are. Uh, we're also going to learn Create React App, how that's a good demo. And these guys right here are actually going to come before that. Classes and modules in JavaScript because they are prerequisite knowledge for understanding some of the things that are used in React. Um, and then once we get down here to React, I might hand it off to Matt um, because he will walk us through a good example. I also have one in the README. Okay, so kicking things off uh, really quick. I've said Node like probably you know four times since this recording started. So what are those things? All right, well, really quick. Um, Node is basically a runtime on your computer, meaning something that is kind of like a server for a language um, that allows you to run JavaScript on your local hardware and do things on your hardware that you can't do typically in JavaScript, right? As we've mentioned earlier, JavaScript is something that's largely based in the web, right? It's in your browser. It can't do anything that really interfaces with, say, like, I don't know, like disk IO operations and things like that, creating files, things like that, of that nature, right? Um, so what Node does is it allows us to do those sorts of operations on our computer. Long story short, if I open up a terminal, right, and I say node, then I can just start running whatever JavaScript I want to in here. And it'll work as expected. Pretty neat. Okay, so really quick, um, before we kick everything off, I'm going to just show you guys how you can install it. Um, all you need to do is just go ahead and open up the link that I have in the readme. Uh, you can also navigate right here to nodejs.org download. Um, they have installers for all sorts of operating systems. If you're on a Unix type operating system, uh, the installation process is going to be a little different, but it's not too difficult. They have guides for every single flavor as well. Um, just to name a few while everyone's installing, like is, does everyone have Node installed in this call or uh, should I wait? Um, I have it installed. Okay. Yeah, I have it too. Okay, cool. So everyone's all clear then. Matt, Matt, do you have Node installed? I actually, I haven't installed Node from the Node website in a very long time, but yeah, I do have it from Brew and NVM. Um, we just want to double check. Nisha, you have Node as well? Yeah. Okay, great. Perfect. Yeah, we're good okay, so for all of you watching at home, go ahead and do this, pause the video um, until you go further. Okay, so getting back to where we were, um, this will install for us by default both Node, the runtime I talked about that lets us put JavaScript on our local computer, and NPM. Okay, so what is NPM? Well, it's something that I mentioned a little bit earlier. What it is, is it is a package registry, okay? So we'll learn a little bit more about this when we get to modules, but you can create compartmentalized modules of JavaScript code. Think of it as like libraries or applications. Um, and then you can post them online, or you can rather, you can post them to the NPM, which is a registry of software, um, which is home. It's actually the largest software registry in the world. It's eight, over 800,000 packages now. It's pretty crazy. Um, so NPM is another shell command that you can use. And it's used to control things like dependencies of your package on other ones. Um, it also allows you to install things to your local computer to use as a global command. For example, you can see here, I don't know how easily you guys can see, but in my terminal, one of the suggestions is installing pure prompt, which is the name of a package. Um, and I installed that earlier and it's the prompt that I'm using. It's very clean looking. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec. Uh, just to reiterate, you can run node just by typing it straight into your terminal and then you can run whatever JavaScript code you might want to. So that's the example I used. We declare A, and then we can log A. Works as expected. Pretty neat. 
OK. So how are we going to use NPM? Well, as I mentioned, it's used to you know, basically download and install software uh, that other people wrote. And we can also use it to create software and upload our own code, right? So the first thing that I'll show you guys is how to create your own package, OK? Um, just to kind of familiarize yourself with what NPM is really supposed to do. So I just made a sample. Um, oh, whoops. I'm actually not in the repo folder right now. Whoops. OK, so I'm just going to go ahead and change into the modules demo that I made here. And to create a package for Node, you would type npm init. Now, I'm going to go ahead and remove the package.json from earlier. And now if we run npm init, it'll give you a quick little walkthrough. It's very friendly. It shows you all the steps in involved in it, um, basically how you can create a package. You give it a version number. I gave the one in our example 0.0.1. Um, you can just press enter as well to skip through all of these and they'll give you the defaults and then license it. And what that'll do is it'll generate for us a package.json file, which just has all the information that we had there. And that's used by NPM when you upload your package to the registry um, in order to basically keep track of what version you're on, uh, what your software is supposed to do, if it's a library or not, whether it has any commands, things like that. Pretty cool. And you might have noticed back in the installation process or in the initialization process um, that it says you can use npm install and then some package name after we use the npm init procedure to install a package and save it as a dependency in the package.json. This is where things get cool, right? If we're writing very intricate software, then we're going to eventually need to depend on some libraries or we're going to need to depend on some build procedures, um, things of that nature. And the way that we control all of these dependencies is through npm, right? So everything that we depend on is going to be stored very neatly in this package.json. For example, let's say I wanted to install Bulma, which is a CSS framework that we talked about briefly a while ago. It does have a flavor on the npm and go ahead and install it. And you'll see here that it has been added as a dependency right there. So it gives you the name of the package that we're depending on, and it gives you the version number that we're depending on. And we can update those as we see fit. Pretty cool. But what if I didn't want to install a library and I wanted to install something that could be used as a global command? Let's say someone used Node to write a file browser, right? Or better yet, let's say someone wrote a handy node command that would allow us, a, a handy JavaScript command that would allow us to automatically create a React app. Hmm, that sounds like something we might want in our, in our lives. So the way we would install it is with npm install, just like we did before. But instead of just you know omitting any flags, we say hyphen g providing the global flag. That just means install it to my entire system, right? Make it a command that I can use anywhere, um, not just a dependency of something else, right? Um, so what I'm going to do is install create react app. This is a command we'll use a little later on in this lesson, um, just to create a nice framework for um, basically a skeleton for a react application. It's made by Facebook, the people who make react. It's pretty cool. So, I'm going to go ahead and run it. I already have it installed, so it's probably going to, yeah. Yeah, so you actually don't have to do this step anymore because um, Node added something to make your life easier. But if you do, there's no problem. It'll run faster. But just so you know, if you're like zoning out at home, this is the right part to zone out. Don't worry about it. Cool. Excellent. Anyways, moving on, that covers like, that's about the extent I'm going to talk about NPM and Node because um, we have a lot of material to get through. Next thing we're going to get into is classes and modules. Okay, I had mentioned really briefly that we were going to talk about, you know, the greater, the, or rather the, uh, the higher level features of JavaScript, right, or the things that you might see in object-oriented programming. And in this case, we're going to just go ahead and dive right in. Um, so one thing that you probably come to expect from any object-oriented language is, well, an object. Right. 
and that's created from something that's a class. It's an instance of a class, right? Now, we've talked about objects at a very high level before. For example, if I open up Node and I declare, as I have here in our notes, example object with curly braces, that's what? An object, right? And you can declare fields however you might want to. And then if we log it, that's very nice and neat. And we can access fields of it if we want to as well. Um, that's all kind of standard stuff. But if we wanted to do something a little bit more intricate, more sophisticated, uh, the example I use here is say a message, right? Then what we would want to do is create a proper class, right? It's a little bit more organized. Maybe it has member functions that we want to have in there. Uh, it has data members that we might want to have. Um, things like that, right? So the way that we declare a class in JavaScript, I'm going to just kind of nuke all of that, <laughs> is very simple. We just type class followed by the name. So in our example, we use message, right? And then from there, we want to give it data members, right? Um, the declaration style is very similar to Python. So in this case, we're going to we're going to create a constructor first, and the constructor is going to provide us a um, sorry a route through which we can actually create the new data members, right? So in this case, I'm not going to give it any parameters, right? Uh, Leo, do you just want to zoom in on the editor? Just so oh yeah, so totally. Everyone can see. Yeah. Sorry about that. Is that can everyone see this better now? Yeah. Okay, cool. Perfect, thank you. Sorry, I wasn't looking at chat. Um, anyways, so now that we can see here, right, the way that we declare a message is just by saying class message, that's the name of the type. And then the way that we create our data members is going to be in the constructor. If you've ever written a class in Python, it's very similar, right? In Python, when we need to create a class, um, we have to basically create all of the members in the constructor. Uh, otherwise they won't exist. Same kind of deal here. So in this case, um, what are some things that we might want to give our message? What are some properties? Any takers? Because we can just write this on the fly here. Like a string, the message? Okay. okay. So let's say we give it Let's give it something that's not message. That'd be kind of ridiculous. Oh, okay. Let's do like, uh, <laughs> let's do like uh, content or something. What's that? Content. Oh, content. Wow, what a, what a great idea. Okay, so contents, right? And since we have no parameters in the constructor right now, um, let's just give it a default value of like high, right? Okay, what are some other things we might want to put in our message? I don't know, maybe like the sender? Okay. Notice how we're declaring these fields, by the way, this dot followed by the name of the field, right? So we have the contents and the sender field now. So the sender, let's say Matt's sending the message. All right. What are some other things? Maybe the... The recipient. Bingo. Recipient. And I'm going to, I'm going to be the one receiving the message today. Great. Okay. So I have in the readme um, an example of kind of like what this would look like if we wrote it up in C++. And it's pretty different, <laughs> right? Because we have to declare the fields outside of the constructor. They're very discrete. They're very distinct from one another. Um, in JavaScript, it's all just kind of boom, put together. It makes for a much more succinct language at the expense of maybe not being or it makes for a much more efficient language at the expense of maybe not being as succinct as C. So just something to bear in mind. Let's say I wanted to take in some arguments in this constructor. Um, I want to be able to take in the contents, the sender and the recipient all at once. How do you think we might do that? Remember here that the constructor is declared like any other function that we've seen in JavaScript. All right, I'll take, I'll take the bullet on this one, team. Um, the way that we're going to do it is just providing some parameters like we would in any function in JavaScript. 
And in this case, I'm gonna just use one letter because it's easier to type. <laughs> and you can see here, we use them like any other parameter. So just as a refresher here, if we declare a function in JavaScript, we would use function name of func, and then we would say param1, param2, and then what we could do is log our parameters as we see fit, just like that, right? And now recall here that these are not typed. It's a little scary. It's very uh, dangerous waters if you've never ventured into this kind of dynamically typed language before, especially one with such coercion. But um, rest assured, this will be okay. All this is gonna do is make our fields inherit the type that they're provided. So if we wanted to be a little bit more explicit here, um, like let's say I wanna make sure that the contents is always going to be a string. I wanna make sure the sender is always a string, recipient's always a string. Um, the way that we're going to end up doing that is by casting them. Does anyone recall how we do that? I'm gonna call on someone. Call someone out, Leah. I'm excited. Okay, Leisha, tell me, how might we turn this C into a string? How are we going to guarantee this? I think it was something like, or something that looks like a function. So it's like string and parentheses. Correct. Bingo. That's how we're going to do it. So what this is doing is kind of like, well, what our constructor is going to do, right? It's going to create a string from the parameter C. Now, Things might get a little bit funky if um, C isn't a type that can be cast to a string or it can't be converted easily. Uh, so another way we could go about this is using the ternary operator, which if you've never seen before is a little unfamiliar. So I'm gonna go ahead and just make it a big if else. All right, so do you remember how we get the type of a variable in JavaScript? The answer is in the question. Big hint. Uh, type of? Correct. Type of. Look at that. Leash is on a roll. So the type of C, and what we're going to do is just hit him with the triple equals. Let me turn off my ligatures. Sorry about that. I like using them, but they are a little bit spooky for people. Um, where are they in here? There we go. That's way easier to read. Okay, so if the type of C is string, then we'll say that the contents are equal to C. Otherwise, here, let's, let's make it super explicit. Otherwise, let's give it a default value. And I'm gonna just say, I. Nice. So that's a better way of doing things. If I wanted to collapse this all down into a ternary, um, the way I would do it is by going like this. If do type of C equals string. Ooh. Then we could say C. Otherwise, we'd say F. All this is is it's just collapsing the if else statement we have up there into a single line. It's a little bit easier to read. In any case, now we have our contents, our sender, and our recipient set. If I wanted to go ahead and demo this in, um, say, Node, then what we could do is just add on to the bottom here. I'm going to just say, to say let m equal and we're going to create a new message yeah okay i'm going to try and breeze through this really quick because we're actually almost halfway through okay sweet so i'm going to go ahead and create a new message and the way we're going to do that is with the new keyword just like we would in say c plus plus right so new is going to allocate a new one it's going to handle all the memory for us we don't have to worry about memory in javascript because if you recall it's a garbage collected language so all I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna just say, hey there, and then I'll leave the sender and recipient uh, as they were, right? So let's just say, actually, here, let's just make it explicit. Great, okay, so we've declared a new message, and then what I'm gonna do is log the message. So if we were to run this in node, which I will right now, then we can see the output of the program, which is just a message type. Nice, pretty clean. 
So what are some other things that we might want to do? Well, we might want to add in some member functions to our type, right? Let's say that I wanted to be able to uh, send the message, right? Well, all you need to do to declare a member function is just like that. You give it the name followed by the params. In this case, send is going to take no parameters because we're going to assume that the contents of the message were set once we created it. And what we're going to do is we're just going to log this dot contents. And then for, this, for good measure, let's just say we return this dot contents as well. I'll talk a little bit more. Well, you'll find out why that's important later on. Okay, great. So let's see here. I'm going to skip over getters and setters um, just for sake of time. And at the very bottom, this part is kind of important, for example, in React. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and write a function now. And it's going to say call, or here, it's going to print string function. And it's going to expect a function f that returns a string. So if I say console.log f, notice here, we're passing the function as though it were a pointer to the function, and then we call it and the output is what gets put to our console. Okay, so what do you think is gonna happen if I call print string function with m dot read, or actually with send is what we use. Here, I'll make this a little smaller for all of us. So let's walk through step by step really quickly. Um, what we're going to do is we're passing down a member function of m, right, called send. So in this case, we're passing down this function right here to it, which is going to log the contents of the message and then return them. And in this case, what we're doing is we're logging the output of this function. So here, what we're doing is we're returning the contents. So this is just going to log the contents twice, right? All right, let's give it a try. Okay we've gotten an error message. Can anyone decipher what this message right here specifically is telling us? This is a hard question. Leo. It is a hard question, but just take a look. It says, cannot read the property contents of undefined. That's kind of the keyword here the property contents of this. So what is it saying here? This is undefined. Correct. What's going on is it's saying that the this keyword, the thing that's supposed to reference the instance of our object, right, doesn't point to anything. It's saying that it isn't, it isn't a thing at all. It's undefined, right? Well, that's no good. Because obviously we would like to say, pass down a function that's a member of a class of an object as any other argument, right? You can think about the applications. Let's say that I had a function that mutates or encrypts some string, right? And then if I hit, if I pass down m.send, I expect to receive the encrypted version of the message, right? But if I get some massive error that's thrown like this, it's not ideal. So the trick we're gonna use here is something that JavaScript provides to handle these sorts of situations. When you're passing down a function pointer or a function as an argument, it actually doesn't have knowledge of this. What JavaScript does to let us account for this is the bind function. The bind function is actually a member of the function type. Pretty crazy. But what it does is it returns a copy of this function bound to a very particular object. So in this case, we're binding it to M. So what we've done here is we've created a new function, which is a copy of M.send, where the this keyword, the this keyword, is equivalent to M. Now, if I wanted to change this to something else, I could very easily do so, but it wouldn't have the intended result. So now, if we take a look here, as expected, we get the contents of the message printed out twice. Kind of a tricky concept to wrap your head around, but it's very essential because you actually it's use it. So, What's sorry. up? Um, is it 
making like a copy of M or is it like M itself? Good question. So what it's doing is it's taking M itself as the this keyword, right? So what happens is it takes a copy of, it returns a copy of m.send, but where the this keyword, this guy right here, points to M, like the actual object M. You can think of it as if every single function has a variable that just points to whatever this is. And by this, I mean the keyword, not this the actual word. Yes. So when you do dot bind, you're just changing the pointer value. And it's a little more complicated than that. Um, two very quick things I'll say on this topic. So one is if this doesn't make sense for you off the bat, it's totally OK. Um, we're going to go over this again on Wednesday when I do intermediate React. And we'll delve, delve a little deeper into how it works. But the second answer is that there's going to be, be a way that we can cheat and not use bind at all. But I just want you to know that this is actually what we're doing under the hood. Um, because if you don't do this and you forget to use the cheat I'm going to tell you about in the next 10 minutes, um, you'll be very confused and this error is not going to make sense. Okay, great. Thanks, Matt. So everyone clear on that? Rithika, you clear on that? Yes. Excellent. All right. So I am going to really quickly go through the next topic that we had on our agenda here, which is modules. Okay. So you may remember from a few lectures ago, a few lessons ago, where I talked really briefly about how there isn't really this notion of a namespace in JavaScript, right? But there is the notion of a module, okay? And the way we can think of this is each file, message.js, you can see here, I have another file, some other file.js, are all encapsulated, right? All the code in there belongs to that file. Well, what if I wanted to import some code from another file, right? Obviously, there's got to be a way of doing this. Otherwise, NPM just wouldn't make sense, right? Why would you have a re registry full of JavaScript code that you can't use? Well, that's where modules come into play. So if I wanted to allow other people to use my message class, it's as easy as saying export. What does export do? It just says, take this class and allow it to be included in other ones, right? Um, another way of doing this is if we wanted to export multiple things all at once. Let's say I wanted to export the name of my function, name of func as well. What we do is we would just provide them as a list in curly braces here. So in this case, what I said is export message and name of func. And I did that right at the bottom of the file. All right, so let's go take a look at some other file.js. And the way that we're going to import a message is by doing so just like this. The way we do it is with curly braces specifying what we wish to import from a particular module, the name of it, and then from this file, right? So if I wanted to import the React module from react.js, then it would be similar format. Great. And then what we can do is we can use it in our code. However, you'll get an issue when you try running this on Node because um, Node does not really deal, it doesn't work well with modules. Um, well, it works well with modules, but when you go through a building procedure. So the way that this would work is if we ran it in, say, a browser. Um, but that's just kind of a, a technicality here, right? All I wanted to get across to you guys is the idea that you can import things from other JavaScript files and the fact that you can export things. Okay, with that all said, 35 minutes in, we're going to start talking about the actual topic that is on the, the on the tin for this lesson. Matt, you want to kick it off with React? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm going to switch over to my screen. Can everyone see this screen? No. Yes. Maybe so. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Just want to make sure. Very self-conscious, you know. It's the Bon Appetit test kitchen. Okay. So, oh no, that's my messages. You can't see that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about React. So I'm going to first have you install React. And then while it takes time to install, we'll talk a little bit about what it is. So you can see my terminal right here. It's very pretty. You know, it has the nice little Apple logo. But I'm going to ask you to type in, in just some random folder, npx create-react-app, and then just the name of the app that you want. I'm just going to call it um, Leo is cool. Uh, and I'm going to hit Enter. So just very quickly, what did we do? 
Uh, as Leo mentioned earlier, right, generally, in order to install a package, you have to use npm install, then you have to run it. Um, but the people who used npm said there's a subset of packages that people only ever install and run once. And it's kind of a waste of time if we made those people, you know, install something they only use once. So they embedded this thing called npx. So long story short, it lets you install and run something once. Uh, but what is create react app? Um, create react app is this boilerplate made by Facebook on top of React. And the long story short is it makes your life easier when you work with React apps. So there's a lot of stuff that normally you would have to deal with, like uh, compiling things, transpiling, polyfilling, um, all these different words that sound very scary and they're from a science fiction movie. And one day we will know what they mean, but for now we will not, and that is okay. So they make a lot of stuff easy. They also have features, like if you save your code, it'll auto reload it in the browser. So for now, we've been making websites with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and we had to refresh the page, and developers are lazy, and we don't want to hit two buttons. So it does that for us, too. And it also manages some other miscellaneous, trivial things that you don't really want to work with in your day-to-day -day life. Uh, people gatekeep all the time, and they're like, oh, you use Create React App? You suck. Those people suck. Um, but honestly, a lot of people use Create React app in production, including Facebook. So it's not like it's a terrible thing that exists. So there's no shame. It's no problem. Anyways, ideally your thing should have finished now. So what this is, is going to do, it's going to create um, a folder called Leo is cool. So I'm going to go into my folder. Uh, and then here, we're going to have a few files that are automatically made for us. It's very convenient. Very nice, right? Uh, very quickly, just to tell you in general what these are, and if you've already worked with Node projects, you already know this stuff. Um, Node modules is a folder of all of the libraries that we've downloaded, and this is going to be thick. This is going to be like 100 megabytes, and something we'll find out is that JavaScript uses lots of libraries. Package.json is this folder, or this is this file, that tells you um, what dependencies or what things that your package needs. So I'm going to open our folder. We're just going to take a little, little, little quick tour to, you know, see what this looks like. And look, it says, hey, you know, dependencies. That seems like something reasonable. Oh, well, we're using React, and we're using React DOM and React scripts and stuff like that. So just to let you know, that's what this file is. Then you'll have another file, either called yarn.lock or package.lock.json. They do the same thing. There's a little bit of a technicality. It doesn't really matter for now. And we'll talk about it next Wednesday. Um, but basically, this is like a very long file that explains all the packages you have downloaded in your own node modules folder. And the long story short is that you should never edit this file. You should always commit it to GitHub. Those are the two most common mistakes that people make. Other than that, we'll cover the rest on Wednesday. But we want to get coding. You know, we're, we're hackers. We're very excited. So uh, do me a favor. Once we're all in this folder, you can run npm start. Uh, this is a command that's like pre-built into most NPM packages. And you can see here, actually, there's like a scripts thing and then a start. And that explains what NPM start does. What it should do is pop up this like website in your web browser automatically, which kind of seems like an invasion of your privacy, which eh, maybe, um, but Facebook doesn't care, right? And it's going to be your React app though. So let me know, give me a thumbs up if you have completed the step and everything works. If this doesn't work, we're going to be in for a ride. There are no thumbs up right now. Are there any problems that people are facing? Mine is just still downloading. Oh, no. Oh, it is because I have all my packages cached. I apologize. OK. We will take a minute. Lisha, is this working for you? I feel like you already have these things installed, right? Yeah, so mine's fine. OK, nice. Rithika and Nisha, are you guys still downloading? Yes, I'm still downloading. OK, no worries. I'll quickly explain a conceptual thing that doesn't rely on any code. So you know, there's this, there's this folder. It's called source. It has our code. It's the source folder. It's very exciting. If we go to app.js, it's like, oh, you know, edit this thing and change it. So I'm, let's just do that. I'm going to write in here, you know, Leo is so cool. And then if we save, it will automatically reload our page and load it for us. Wow, this is great. This is amazing. The technology is beautiful. This is what 2020 is about. So very useful feature. If we introduce a bug, though, so I'm going to introduce a bug by deleting this first line, it'll give us an error. So this is very useful for debugging. Um, the other thing I'll note is that it'll also give you warnings if you do code that's like 
sketchy, but like not bad. Um, but you should get rid of those warnings anyways, because they're warnings and you're probably doing something bad. And also when we build our app, those are going to become errors and they're going to crash our build and that's no bueno either. Are we still downloading? Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. In the meantime, we will quickly discuss the content on this page and I will zoom in so it's easier for you to see. Okay. So a few things I just want to point out very, very quickly. What do we got on this page right now? So first we got this import react from react. Two things I want to quickly say about this. One, this thing over here is not a file. It just says react. Well, how NPM works is kind of smart. You know, this is a combination of NPM and Webpack technically. But it's like, hey, you know, maybe you don't have a copy of React on your computer, but we should check that folder we made, node modules. So if you can't find a local file on your computer called React, it will then look at node modules for a file called React. And it turns out there is one called React. However, this means that you should never make a, full, a, a file called React. And I don't think I've seen people do that, so we're in the clear. But I just want to let you know, don't do that. That's a bad idea. So don't make a file called React. The second thing here is there's no braces here, and you might be a little confused. Uh, and it's because we kind of skipped over object destructuring. It's kind of complicated, but the long story short is we're gonna use something like what we did here on line 26, which says export default app. So this is like exporting a list, but it says, hey, instead of a list of stuff, make the default thing this function or class or whatever I'm gonna make. Uh, and then if you import anything, just make it the default. So why does this and the name thing exist? It's like in the weed stuff. I don't really worry about it for now, but just letting you know, that's how that works. So there's a default export from React and it's called React. Wow, that was confusing. Two other quick things. So one, this line. So here we can import uh, photos. So an SVG is like a kind of photo and it, um, compared to a PNG and a JPEG, SVGs are like lines. So you, you know, set two points and then you like describe the line between them. It's not like a pixel by pixel kind of thing. Um, I wrote a paper on this, so we can talk about this more if you want, but it's not very exciting. Uh, I don't know why I wrote the paper on it. But yeah, it's very efficient, easily scalable, uh, lots of great things, it uses Lempel Ziv, okay, no, not important. Anyway, so you can import, import photos and you can plop them into your screen. So if you look at this thing, right, this image tag right here, we're used to having source as a parameter for an image. But here instead, we have this brace and then logo. So what's up with that? Well, the first thing we're gonna learn about React is that in React-like HTML, uh, you can kind of just slide in JavaScript whenever you want. And you can do that by using a brace set. So we have a brace here, then logo, this thing on the inside is gonna be evaluated as JavaScript. We imported a variable called logo from the image and we're gonna plop it into the source here. So this is like a little bit of overloading magic, but that's how that works. Let's quickly test out our hypothesis here. And we're also gonna test out your knowledge of JS type conversions. So first I'm gonna do Leo says one plus, or uh, Leo says, meh, no, I, sorry, one sec. Leo says, okay, what is this going to print on the screen? Nish, I'm gonna call you out here. You're, you do AIML, you're good at math. What is this gonna put on the screen on the right over here? Um, I, I know I should know from our Kahoot, but I don't remember. That's okay. <laughs> if I was what? guessing, I would say like everything would convert to string, but I don't really know. Okay, so right now it's gonna convert to a number. It was a good guess though. I like where your head is at. And the reason why is because these are all numbers, right? So number plus number is number, here's two and we're chilling. Rithika is probably extremely confused if she has not seen this previous video. But, but here's, here's where things get tricky. So, Nish, I'm going to ask you the same question again. What is this going to print on the screen? So now it would convert to strings, right? So if we see here, now it does, JavaScript does its weird stuff. And instead of getting 43, like a normal person probably would expect, we get 421, the string. But the important thing is that this, anything inside the brace gets evaluated as JavaScript. Uh, and reality, what gets printed out is whatever this statement returns. So it turns out this statement returns, you know, uh, 42 plus one, which is 421 instead of 43. But hey, you know, you might say, okay, uh, you know what other else returns things like functions, right? Can we write a function and use it in our, in our 
thing, that would be great. And I know we haven't actually explained what this thing does yet. I'll get to that in a moment. And yeah, we can. So I'm going to write a function that says, you know, quick max, right? And I'm just going to make it return uh, two plus two, right? So if I write quick maths here, like this, what should I get? Alicia, I'm going to call on you for this one. Four? Or unless, do you have to do the this dot quick math? OK, ah, so. Hmm. Uh, hmm. Hmm. Interesting. So what have I done here? What am I doing? What is, what is quick maths right here? Oh, that's just a reference. You didn't ah, call it. Yeah, so this is not going to work. It's going to be yeah. angry, right? And the reason why is because I didn't call the function. This is a reference to the function. And you're like, Matt, that was like a, why would you, why would you make we should do that? And the answer is that the difference between references to functions and functions is going to be super, super important because in React, we're going to pass around functions all the time. So yeah, if I do this, as Alicia said, quick maths, we're going to get four. Great. Okay. So now let's circle back bigger picture. What the hell is going on here? Um, so React, allows you to build your website in a set of components. And this is kind of going to bleed into why we use React. Uh, we're going to go back to my Twitter feed. I guess I didn't learn from last time and pre-prepare an example. Let's go on Twitter. Uh, so, you know, I'm on Twitter. I don't want that on my video. All of these are pretty sus. What is this? OK, well, whatever. This is my Twitter. I'm sorry. Um, there are a lot of things here on the page that are kind of duplicated, right? So here we have the Anthony Fauci fan club, right? We have a photo of Anthony Fauci, and then we have Fauci fan. And this has a very, very similar, you know, layout to big Tucson dad's posts about the U.S. failing the coronavirus response. Wow, this is a really, I'm going to like that. Though. This is a really depressing, actually, yeah. Okay, so if you notice there, though, I didn't just do that for fun. If you notice, right, each of these things are very similar. They have a set of actions that we can perform on them, right? In this case, I'm liking the tweet, or I could retweet, or I could comment, right? And in that situation, I could individually code each of those components. But that is a huge waste of time, right? It'd be much better if I could model these things as, I don't know, a class or an object, and then apply the object-oriented principles that David Smallberg taught you about and you know, really make a kick-ass web app. So that's what we want to do with React, right? We want to make sure that when you have a web app with a ton of different interactive things on the screen, that we can A, model the interaction very easily, and B, programmatically create a bunch of these things. And you can now think why Facebook would want something like this, right? Because, you know, Facebook has so many different things on their web page that kind of look like the Anthony Fauci fan club. So we want to be able to kind of replicate that in code. I see Arjun has joined us as well. Arjun, I'm sorry that you walked in on the Anthony Fauci fan club, but I promise that there was more context here. But let's go back to React. So I want to make a component, right? The app component is like the default root component in your React system. And there's actually a bit of trickery in terms of how this works and builds into your website, but I wouldn't really worry about that for now. Uh, but you just kind of have to buy the fact that this is how it works. So every React component that's a function just needs to return this thing called JSX, uh, which is JavaScript, XML, name's not important, I'm not going to cahoot you on that. But the idea here is that we're going to return something that kind of looks like HTML, but as we just mentioned earlier, you can do some kind of wacky things with it, right? You can add JavaScript, and as we're going to see, you can use things like MapReduce and other methods to generate a bunch of HTML really easily. Um, the thing you need to know here is that when you return the JSX thing, there needs to be like one container. So if I add like another div here, like that, this is going to crash because it says, hey, you can't do that. There needs to be one container. So just, just to keep in the back of your mind, there needs to be one big HTML tag that you return. Um, does that make sense so far, Julia? Yes. So this is a function, and it returns something. But sometimes you can do things with functions, right? So let's, let's make a new function, and we're going to figure that out. So quick math is kind of dumb. I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to call this instead the fan club maker, OK? So I'm going to put a parenthesis here. This is just a normal function that we're going to make, right? And I want this to maybe, you know, take in some, ooh, what's, the, what's a good word? Not attributes, not arguments, properties. I like properties. So we're going to take in some properties 
and then we're going to do something with them and create our final thing. So at a convention, I'm going to call this props. We'll see why later. Um, and then I'm going to return what I want to do. So here I'm going to say, hey, you know, uh, oh, I want to uh, I want to put the props in my in my code. How would I do that? Rithika, I'm going to put you on the spot. How would I put JavaScript inside of my JSX here? Um, you do the braces, and then you call like this dot props. Beautiful, beautiful. Rithika, you're killing the game. No. The most quick thing that I'll say is that we're not going to use this yet. You're jumping the gun. You already know what we're going to okay. do in five minutes. But this is a function, so we're not going to do this yet. We're just going to do okay. props. It's like that. Cool. And then when I call it, I'm just going to bop this in here. I'm going to say, hey, we'll do fan club maker. I'm going to put in RG. Okay. So if I save this, right? Um, uh oh, this didn't work. Hmm. That's a good question. Why didn't this work? Ah, that's right. Because this is looking for a dot name, but in actuality, um, this. This should just be like this or something, right? Like that. So we do that, they'll say Arjun. Arjun's like, oh, it did not make the connection. See, look, everyone has a chance to learn something in our Learning Labs crash course. This is beautiful. But yeah, as you can see, you know, I can call fan club maker, right, like a function, and then it just works like that. Uh, now you might say, Matt, this looks kind of dumb. I don't really like how this looks. I want it to look more like an HTML tag. And Zuckerberg would agree with you. So instead, uh, well, I'm just need to capitalize this. We can create this like custom component tag thing like this, and then I'm gonna or I'm just gonna type this out, and then we'll kind of see how it works. And then I'm gonna delete that. Uh, uh oh. Ah, okay. Well, eh. there we go. Okay, I'll just quickly explain what what just happened. So. I said, hey, I hate this function thing. It looks dumb. So I'm going to instead use this HTML syntax tag, right? Um, the thing here is just the name of your function. So in this case, it's called fan club maker. And then now we're going to change things up a bit. So now that we use this syntax, it looks it's a little clearer about why I called this a property, right? Normally, other HTML tags have classes and IDs and you know style and, and whatever, all these other properties that are attached to them. And we say, hey, we want to take that and extend it to JavaScript. So here, right, I'm going to make my own property. I'm going to call it name. And then I'm going to put in whatever I want. And this is exactly like HTML. I'm going to put the quotes. I'm going to put in the string. And then here, this is kind of what Rithika was talking about earlier. Now props is not just a random argument. It's going to be all the properties that are attached to this tag. Does that make sense? And so here we're going to look for one that's called name. But if I instead said props.greeting, right, this isn't defined. So this is not going to show anything on the screen. But if I want to add a greeting, right, like uh, it's going to work exactly the way you think it is. And in this case, there's no space because I didn't add a paragraph tag. But this is how it looks. So here we go. We've created our own component. And I say, Matt, this component is like useless because I could have just totally copy pasted this uh, and it would have been fine. OK, OK. You know what? Fine. You're right. But uh, let's say we want to generate a list of these things. And this is going to be our first step into actually using React about its, like, why it's intended. So I'm going to make a list up here called list of people. And I'm just going to put in it, you know, Leo, Arjun, Misha, Misha, and Rithika. Great. So. Oh, let me use that. Now, here's where things get spicy, right? Um, we talked about this in our third lecture. If you forgot this, it's totally fine. But there is this function called map. And map operates on a set of arrays and then creates another set of arrays. And you apply the function to each element in the array. And at the time, I was giving you dumb examples like multiplying a number by two. But like, we know how to do that. We're, we've taken math 31A, OK? But instead, we're going to use it on our array of strings and create React components. And this is kind of where things get very excited. I'm going to do map, as we normally do. And the thing inside here needs to be a function. Okay. So uh, how could we possibly create a function here? Alicia, I'm going to ask you this because I know I've taught you this before. Uh, you passed 
it an anonymous function? Beautiful, beautiful. Lucia, chef's kiss, okay? So I'm going to create an anonymous function and uh, I'm gonna use error notation. Um, I don't think we have talked about error notation. Ah, did we? I don't know. If not, I'll talk about it on a Wednesday for sure. It's already in the notes, but I'm gonna do this. And then the error notation just means that the thing here needs to return something. Like this is the body of the function and this is the name of the parameter. If this portion doesn't make sense, we'll go over it on Wednesday. So I wouldn't worry too much, but I just wanna show you like why React is useful. And then here, I'm gonna put in fan club maker name and this is where things get very spicy, right? So what's, what's going on here? So here, I'm creating a list of things, right? Um, oops, sorry. So I'm creating a list of things, and each of the things in this list is a React component. So React components are like any other type in JavaScript, right? They're an object. And so when we create an array of them, we're going to pass the names from each of the lists. We're going to say we're going to first operate on Leo, make a fan club maker for Leo then Arjun, then Lisha, then Nisha, then Rithika, um, and et cetera, right? So if we save this, we're gonna get this, right? We've created our own components and each of these has its own kind of little thing, okay? So this is our first step into why React is useful because you can generate lots of things like this very easily. And I'm sure as you imagine while we were stalking my Twitter feed, right? What Twitter actually does with React is they have a little component for each tweet. Right? And the tweet has the username and the photo and their at and the time the tweet was made and the body of the tweet, the hashtags weighted, all these different kinds of things. And as we'll practice more and more over the next few weeks, we're gonna make more complex components that take advantage of these other kinds of things. Lit, okay. Um, I'm mindful of time and I'm also supposed to have a meeting with Arjun soon. So very quickly, I'm gonna tell you about class-based components. We're gonna quickly go over buttons and getting inputs from people and then I think we'll call it a day. And on Wednesday, we'll continue. Um, so first, you know, Leo talked to you 15 minutes about classes. You got to take CS32. We don't want to put that knowledge to waste. So let's make this a class instead. So it turns out um, classes in JavaScript are kind of like functions. And in fact, you can use them very similarly. So I'm going to make a class. I'm going to call it fan club maker. Here I'm going to type in extends react.component. Okay, uh, I'm sure. All of you have slight horror flashbacks to CS32. Does anyone remember what extends or implements or inherits or what, what, what do those words kind of have to do with CS? Like a hierarchy. Hierarchy of what? Like what, what's, what's going on here? I'm confused. I've never taken CS31. I'm a first year. You need to explain to me. What does this mean? Um, you're, you're going to like get functions and properties from react.component, the thing that you're extending. Rithika, beautiful. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I, I've become enlightened. Okay, I, I'm going to be excited to be a CS major now. Um, yeah, exactly. So as Rithika said, right, um, what this means is it's a form of inheritance. So the people who made React, you know, they're very smart. They did lots of coding and uh, yeah, they're just very good at what they do. So they made a class called react.component and it has to do with the components that I talked about. And we'll learn, I think on Wednesday or Friday, that there are a set of things related to components that are very useful. The first set of thing we're gonna talk about is the render function. So the render function is basically the same thing as this earlier function we wrote, right? All we're doing is we're gonna say, hey, please render this on the screen. And the render function should always return the JavaScript, the JSX thing that has your thing. So this was a correct refactor. So this earlier function that we made, and then this new class, they do the same thing. The output is the same, right? We had to make one more change. And this is where Rithika's giant, like huge brain comment 10 minutes ago came into play. So she already jumped the gun. She knew we were gonna go to classes. So now this is where we're gonna use this.props, right? Because every time we make a new class here. We're creating like a new instance of a class and each class has its own properties, right? So now when we're using a class, well, how the heck are we gonna know what properties belong to this class? We're gonna use this, which is this. The this is the this, see, it was, English is ambiguous. So things work, life is very cool, Liddy, great. Okay, um, shoot. If you don't mind, I'm gonna take up like four to six minutes more of your time. I just wanna very quickly get through the rest of the fan club so we can like shower Arjun with praise and then we will, you know, uh, give you back your time. So 
fan club, this is not very useful, right? I can't really do anything with it. I want to be able to like say how many people are in the fan club or increase the number of people in the fan club. So I, the first thing we need to do is we need to keep track of how many fans someone has, right? So let's see here. We're going to do this. Only fans are zero, right? That's how many fans they have, okay? So, uh, but now we want to make this interactive. We want to add a button and all that kind of stuff. So the f what we're going to do here is think about this concept called app state. So we're going to talk about this more on Wednesday, but the very brief idea is that if there's something inside a component that it can change and it wants to keep track of and it wants to control, this is the state. So if you have a tweet, how many likes you have on Twitter, um, hey, this is a PG-13 stream. I don't know what y'all are talking about with this OnlyFans thing. Okay, I'm a, I don't know what's going on with your minds. I'm trying to keep this interactive. Okay, so right, your app state, like it's like a tweet has how many likes the tweet has maybe. That's probably something that the tweet's gonna get from somewhere else, right? So that's not really part of the state. But if it's something wants to keep track internally of the tweet, like has the user shared this tweet yet, right? Or has the user liked the tweet, then we should display a little red heart. That's part of the state. In this case, we want to define the state as how many fans the person has, right? So we're going to make a top level just variable. We're going to call it state, okay? And then, and this is the same syntax as Leo introduced earlier um, with, you know, variables and stuff. And we're going to make this an object. So if you don't remember from JavaScript, an object is a key and a value pair. So the key is going to be like how you look it up, and then the value is the value. So I'm going to do fans. Maybe we'll do only fans. Because again, I have no idea what this spelling of only fans would, would have to do with anything. And I'll do colon. And here we're going to put in the default values. I'm going to put in zero. OK? Because someone starts out with zero fans. Make sense? Cool? Yes? OK, great. So now I want to make this thing update from the state. And this is a thing in JavaScript. So how would I inject JavaScript into this part of the code? Any thoughts? Anything we've learned so far? Use curly braces. Beautiful. What would I put in the curly braces? This is the tricky part. OK, so this is a variable that belongs to our class, right? So what is there a word that we've learned that tells us things about things that might belong to this class? This, this, there we go. Beautiful. No, no hints were needed. So we type in this, right? And then we're just going to get a property of the class. We're going to do state, right? This is just a variable. And then this variable has its own, you know, key in it. So we're going to do only fans, right? Also, please don't tell Rucha or Catherine about this because you may go get in trouble. I don't know. I think we'll be fine. This is PG-13. I haven't talked about anything weird yet. Okay, so we're going to do this. It still displays zero because that was the default value. But now you can see if I change this to five, this is going to become five on the right, right? So clearly this is working. Last thing we want to do is update the state. Okay, and this is the, one of the trickier concepts to remember in React. So when we update the state, we need to tell React to update the state. And this is one of the huge benefits of React, right? You know, there's so many things on my tweet page, right? I mean, no one's sliding into my DMs, but you can imagine that someone's sliding into your DMs, right? So they want to update the DM every time the person's like, hey, you up? You know, you want to put that into the DM. At the same time, there's going to be new tweets that load, new advertisements, right? And with older websites, you would refresh the entire page every time you get an update. But Twitter and Facebook and Instagram have way too many things happening at once. So if every time you updated the page, you refreshed everything, that'd be a huge waste of resources and the user wouldn't like that. So one of the big benefits of React is that they only update things when they need to update it, right? When the app state or the app props update, okay? So we need to tell React hey, we're going to update this state here, and you should just change this part of the page. And it's not going to change any other part of the page that doesn't depend on the state. It's going to be just that part. Does that make sense as a concept? So we want to tell the app when we're going to update it. So then it's like performant and stuff. And this is really important. Coolio? Great. OK, so um, we're going to do just that. So I, we're going to first create a button here. Um, also, I'm just going to make this easier for you to, to see. 
I'm just going to add a HR here so you can like see where the component starts. Okay, great. So here we have this button that says I'm an only fan. Okay. And if you remember from our JavaScript intro lesson, you can add this thing called an on click listener. So every time the button gets clicked on the click, it'll do something else. So I'm going to do that, but I need to first, you know, what am I going to make the thing do? Right. Um, I should make something that, I don't know, handles the button click. Maybe that seems like a good word to describe it. So I'm going to make something called like a click handler. Yeah, seems, seems reasonable. Uh, and here I'm going to use error notation again. Um, I, we kind of ran out of time, but like, I'll tell you about why we're going to use error notation on Wednesday. And here in this function, I want to do whatever I want to do when I handle the click. And in this case, I want to change the state. Okay. So there's actually two ways we can do it. I'm going to tell you the easy way and then the correct way. So the easy way is with this, a function, sorry, that's not true. There are three ways. I'm going to tell you the wrong way, the easy way, and the correct way. So the wrong way to do it would be this. So this dot state dot bit only fans equals only fans plus one. Actually, we could just do this. This is not Python. Okay, great. So we could do this, right? There's one problem here. Okay. And this is like huge, big brain energy. Okay. Does anyone remember what are the primitive types of JavaScript? If you don't, I do not blame you. This is like not a sexy only fans topic. Okay, I'll, I'll answer my own question here just in the interest of time. So an object is not a primitive object, which sounds dumb. But the reason why and why this matters is because if this changes, the thing that this dot state dot only fans points to changes, you won't know from this dot state because it's an object. This is the same thing as like pointer issues with constant, right? So you have to tell React. React's too dumb to know. So the, the way that most people would do it is with a function called this dot set state. This dot set state sets the state and you pass it an object with the new state you want. So in this case, you know, we want to change only fans, right? And here we can put this dot state dot only fans because we're reading from it plus one, right? Does this make sense so far? So we're taking the current value of only fans. We're going to add one and we're going to set that to the new value of only fans. All good with only fans. Great. Okay. And then it's, it's just going to work like that. Um, as a heads up, you have to do it with this arrow function, or this is not entirely going to work, but we'll, we'll find out why later. Great. And the last thing is we just need to call this function somehow. So I'm going to go to button. I'm going to add an on click, you know, like normal. Um, and it's capitalized because it's a JSX attribute. So it's a little different from the, um, the default in HTML. We're going to put a brace in here. Now, this is where I ask Alicia the question again. Alicia, what am I going to put here? with click handler? Do I put the parentheses or do I not put the parentheses? You do not put parentheses. Why is that? Because uh, we're just trying to give it the function that it should call when there's a click. Alicia, this is amazing. This is, this is the positive attitude I need in my life. Yeah, so we're going to just put in the name of the function, but we're not going to put in the parentheses. And the reason why is, as Alicia said, we're just passing in a pointer. We're not actually calling the function. Because if we put in with the parentheses, it would call the function. So it would do this thing, which is not what we want. OK? Great. You can also put the this in there, because it belongs to the function. You know what I mean? So I'm going to do this. I'm going to click I'm an only fan. And look, Leo has so many only fans now. Right? I can't leave Arjun out of this. Okay, Arjun, i got to give you the only fans too. Look, Arjun is gaining mad only fans right now. So as you can see, we've successfully gone through a way where we can render a list of things to a page. We can control things about stuff on the page, and we can update those things. And obviously, this was a very trivial example, right? Um, and I'm sure the OnlyFans website has much more complicated interactions than our version of OnlyFans. But as you can see, uh, we have made our own very basic React app that touches on a few key concepts. So if you're watching at home and you're about to fall asleep, should wake back up. This is the most important portion. And if you're here with me, we're all going to be done in like two minutes. Okay. So what did we talk about today? What's important? Leo told you about Node and NPM, right? So this is a way you can run JavaScript on not your browser. And uh, NPM is a way that you can download libraries and use code that other people wrote, like React. We talked about how to install Create React app with NPX. 
And then we opened up the example and we just talked a little bit about the basic project structure. So for things like package.json, package.lock.json, um, I don't remember, there's one more thing that I forgot. What was the other thing? That, that was it. Oh, node modules, right, node modules. Uh, and then we went over the, the stuff in the example. So we talked about these imports and how they work. Uh, we talked about the export default thing very briefly. I mentioned React components, how they can both be functions and classes, but no matter what, the render function has to return JSX. We talked about what makes JSX special. So it's like HTML, but um, you can add JavaScript. Oh, and also very quickly, the class thing is renamed class name because class is used for classes. You know, like that was not a confusing sentence at all. I mean, CSS classes are renamed the class name because the word class is protected because it's used to define this kind of class. So when you use CSS classes, you have to use class name. And then we talked about using the map function on arrays to generate a list of components. So we can easily duplicate a lot of stuff on a web page without you know, duplicating a lot of code. And then finally, we talked very briefly about app props and state and how we can modify state uh, with OnlyFans. So very exciting. And we talked about you know, this click handler and how that works. We talked about this dot set state um, and yeah, okay. That was a lot of stuff that we covered today. And if you remember my Queer Hacks workshop for this was like another hour. So we have a lot more ground to cover, but hopefully this gives you a good enough idea of the very bare bones basics of React, right? How to do a basic hello world app. Um, and then, yeah, I don't wanna keep you all for here too much longer. We'll see you on Wednesday. Uh, or if you're watching at home, we'll see you on YouTube. And if you have any other questions, please, you can let us know now. You can let us know later. You can DM us, you know, like and subscribe, you know, smash that subscribe button and uh, let us know. We yeah. also have office hours. And we also have office hours. We have Leo's, uh, mine are tomorrow, Leo's are on Friday. Yeah. Uh, hit us up, let us know. Okay. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to stop the recording now and then we'll see if our participants have any questions. If you're watching at home, like, subscribe, OnlyFans. Arjun has 40 OnlyFans. I'll see you all later. Aw, oh, 